I'll tell you what I think of love, the greatest of all heavenly things, replied Angelina. Love is the finest refreshment of mortal life, providing a glimpse into the heavenly state, a vision which, if maintained, can last well beyond the initial perception and for all of one's life. So I say that any time not spent on love is time squandered in absolute waste, that if one is idling, not loving, or God forbid hating, then life is a wasting. For love is the greatest experience on earth, and so I have often sought it out, found it, received it, given it, and lived it as life's one great happiness, for there is no other joy that compares, love being the truth of all truths. Who has not forgotten that first kiss and the magic that attended it? No one for first love touches one deeply and forever. People newly in love glow for weeks on end. There is nothing like love, although strangely some do not actively seek it out, perhaps for fear of rejection. But even love's worst pain is sweeter by far than any other pleasure. There is indeed no contest, and to love and lose is second only to loving and triumph. Not merely just a pleasure, Love refreshes, creates, invigorates, and provides sustenance of spirit and life itself. Without love, there is no life, at least none worth living. When you give up on love, you begin to die. Love knows no laws or restrictions, for mutual passion is a law unto itself. Love is the cure-all, both for those who receive it and for those who give it. The one tragedy in life is not death, but that some people do not love, aye, nor do they live, for the fear of the one is fear of the other. So by all means if you love someone, go to them and tell them so. It is said that the loving are the daring, perhaps because they seek the ultimate adventure, often risking all for that which lies far and above the commonplace, that vision into paradise. Imagination weaves a fairy tale of love and romance, and the mind that is alive soon brings forth the phantasm into reality. Placing our very life and happiness in another through love is the greatest gift one can give, for it is the gift of oneself. Unconditional love is a true gift, one without strings attached, one without any motive for gain in return. Oh, of course we are human, and often love for the sake of being loved in return, and this is not in itself wrong. But when one loves for no other reason than for the sake of generosity and loving, then this is a saintly type of love which is above all the other kinds. True love loves people for what they are, not for their qualities in particular, but for the person. It's not that we love someone because we need them, for this is quite immature, but that we need someone because we love them. It is, you see, love that is the origin. Love begets love, and love in turn begets more love, and so on, making us even more loving to others, until heaven is indeed brought down to earth. Real love is its own reward. Identity is not lost in love. For true lovers do not sit looking only into each other's heart, but rather look outward, each in the same direction. It is a seeming violation of arithmetic, that in love the two become much greater than one plus one, and that the two, nevertheless, do not become one, but remain as two, yet still share the same vibration in their souls. It also seems to be a paradox that love, when divided, is not at all diminished, but that each individual love multiplies to exceed the lot. One can never run out of love. It is a miser indeed who withholds love from a capacity that is boundless. Hoard not that which can be given. Give love and even more love comes back full circle to you. What a joy it is to experience life's wonders with someone you love. Oh, walks and plays, and dinners are great enough pleasures when taken alone, but note how much better they are when you have someone to share them with. Another bonus of love is that, with it behind your actions, you may soon find yourself doing the impossible, 
as love's inspiration carries you along through any kind of difficulty. For me, it was an inspiration to draw and write. Love and a kind heart are much alike, and one is equivalent to the other, love being a triumvirate of truth, beauty, and goodness blended into one great purity. We do not merely love, we are love, we do not create, we are creation itself. We don't just live, we are life. There are many forms and faces of love such as brotherly, sisterly, motherly, fatherly, romantic, spiritual, professional, and physical, and it often depends much upon the circumstance which one is the most appropriate form to give to a particular person, but in all of the above forms of love, there is much more that could be given. I'll tell you the greatest earthly thing, adventure. Boredom and dull routine have little place, if any, in a life, and it is only by one's own laziness that they are allowed to exist at all, languishing nearby on the doorstep, as it were, as uninvited guests, as all the while terrible complaints are hurled against them. I'm bored, we say, half-heartedly hoping that some new entertainment will appear out of the blue and carry us away from a dreary commonplace existence, perhaps into a fairy tale. So, adventure calls constantly to us as a cure for the blahs, for routine dulls the senses. Even the greatest music soon begins to fall unheard on our ears and gradually degenerates into that same old song. Although breaking the chains of routine often requires a great burst of energy, adventure can become self-sustaining once the seeds have been planted. Yes, initially some hard work must be applied since adventuring is not normal, free and easy in this world, but remember that before all realized realities must come the dream, the creative vision, the attitude and the outlook that will bring adventure to life. Even before the dream comes the yearning, though it's dim at first, faintly glowing as a phantasm in a fleeting daydream struggling to maintain its shape before it fades into the noise of day. As these shadows pass over the adventurous mind, the vision must be enhanced and then steadily pursued until it, at last, becomes three-dimensional and real. We often look back later, quite amazed at the wonders that we have wrought, but we had the vision. The rewards of adventure are many. Stimulation, experience, and growth are practical results, but foremost comes joy, exhilaration, and thrill. The feeling of being alive. Who has not known the adventure of walking to school alongside a stream, dallying here and there, then crossing over the water on a log, nearly slipping off but catching oneself at the last instant while skipping a heartbeat? Who has not known the electricity of the first kiss at summer camp? or of the reading or writing of a great poem or story while basking warm and cozy in winter sunshine, or the thrill of a job well done. If we no longer know such things, then perhaps now is the time to stop worrying about getting one's hair messed up. It's all a matter of style, purpose, and vision. To plant the seeds of adventure, one must seek out the uncommon, the unusual situation, the exotic, even in one's own backyard, looking for the odd character. Although certainly not those who are unhealthy, the pleasantly eccentric, by today's staid standards, the person willing to try just about anything that isn't illegal, the offbeat but upbeat person, the optimist, the exciting prospect, the person with those excitingly wonderful and harmless character defects. And so it is that once you find it, adventure begets more adventure, for ideas from all over soon begin to interact and build until a person rises above mere existence and really lives. Oh, I've had many adventures myself, from romance in the South Seas to mysterious intrigue in the villages of France, but travel and romance are only a general means to adventure. There are many more, mostly personal, for it depends on what you want from life. Adventure can be had in one's own village. Of course, some adventures entail a minor amount of risk-taking and rule-breaking, for that which is often uncommon is often the most extraordinary. 
and therefore must draw undue attention from those in the straight world, but I ask you, does not the element of danger often greatly heighten the excitement? Who has not, in the throes of spring fever, slyly disappeared from the place of employment on some exciting romantic mission and found adventure in that forbidden quest? Yes, adventure is lived in that delightful middle state in which one is neither drunk nor sober, nor ever totally reckless, but ever balancing excitement with responsibility, each paying for the other, as we walk the thin line between foolishness and adventure, the log across the creek. So I say to some of you, prime the pump, seek out adventure, embrace it. Use your emotions, get up out of your chair and into the arena. Open up and invite adventure in. Give it, take it, and live life with a reasonable passion and with a passionate reason. For adventure can even become a commonplace situation that one can tolerate. Our greatest adventure is living life and writing about it in this book, an art. Tell me about writing, Peter. Artists create after living and feeling whether it be for real or accomplished only in their minds and dreams. Although this artistry too is living and self-sustaining, although secondary as art becomes its own reward, that is, the complete satisfaction is in the creative act itself. The sharing or selling of it either comes later or is not necessary. Just give it away. Lord Byron once wrote, Tis to create, and in creating, live a being more intense. Artistry, as in our writing and illustration, is inspired by, and is intertwined with living a being more intense. If our dreams inspire living, then our living inspires more dreams, including the writing of them and the living of them. When I wrote Star Trek, The Death Wave, I truly felt that I was out in space. I wrote the last night's almanac when I had a terrible flu, but while writing it felt fine, not even realizing that I was sick, being transported in time and space to the dark ages. Sometimes one needs to accumulate experiences, including reading, in order to write. Mostly for me, ideas come only when they may, after some subconscious maturation process, the poems and novels then nearly writing themselves. My writing can never be done on demand, the art is the satisfaction. The selling of it for peanuts comes only out of the unconditional love of sharing it. We all contribute to the world what we do best. If that happens to be telling jokes, then that's what we give away for free. Otherwise, in our case, writing and art. In most areas of my writing, especially in the Universal Wisdom poems, I must live the ideas first, in order to prove that the advice can be written down and dispensed. Same for romance or self-help, as for me, it would not be fair to write something that really couldn't happen. In most of my novels, I try to show for inspiration how good life could be instead of a list of things not to do. So then, when the reader sees just how fine life and love can be, the reader just runs right out and does it.